And good morning, everyone, again. Uh, today, we're still in the book of Romans. We're working our way right along through Romans. Last week, we had a big chunk of scripture when we dealt with the entirety of the 11th chapter. Today, we're only going to look at eight verses in chapter 12. Um, there's this shift, and everyone makes a comment that the first few, few chapters of Romans, uh, the first 11, really, are about more theological-oriented things, especially 8, 9, 10, and 11. And now he's turned to more about what, how we're supposed to behave and what we're supposed to do. Um, a little more along the lines of life application. So a lot of times people enjoy this part of the Bible or a part of Romans more than the rest. I'll confess I kind of like chapter 11 a lot, but that's just me. It's dense in theology and, and things like that. But chapter 12, Paul goes kind of right, to, right back to it. So I'm going to start, though, with verse 36 in, 11, in chapter 11, and then we're going to read through verse 8. So I lied. We're going to do nine verses, Jerry. I, I, I hedged my bet there a little bit. Uh, these are on page 922 in the Pew Bible, 1136 to 128. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's a doxology. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the, the teacher in teaching, the encourager in encouragement, the giver in sincerity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. And we're going to do this backwards, as I sometimes do. We're going to look at verses 3 to 8 just real quickly, because we're going to spend most of our time actually in verse 2. Verses 3 to 8, he's talking about that we all have different gifts. We have different functions. And we talk about that a lot, and it's important. That's why we talk about it a lot. Not if any of us have the same abilities. We, we have crossovers, but we all have multiple abilities. Sometimes we don't use them at different stages in our lives, and sometimes our abilities change. Sometimes things that we could do when we were young, we can't do, obviously, as we get older. But then, by converse, there are sometimes we have perhaps more patience and empathy and more understanding, or more just wisdom as we get older. And so we have abilities that we didn't have when we were younger. So, but we do need to remember that each and every one of us has a place. No one should think more highly of themselves, Paul says, than they should. Not that you have a false modesty, not that you don't realize that God gave you a gift, but that you don't think that that gift makes you any more special than anyone else. You think not, you don't put yourself down, you just don't think about yourself so much. You use that gift that God blessed you with to help others. That's the idea of humility. That's about the idea about using God's gifts. You don't ignore the gift that God gave you. Because that would be a sin against God. God gave you a gift for a reason. You need to use it. You need to use it for the furthering of the kingdom. And so we want to remember that. Let's go to verses 1 and 2. And I read verse 36 because it sets that up, because he says, therefore, and therefore, but it always goes to what was there before, what was before it. Uh, for from him, he's talking about for from him, from God, and through him, God, and to him, God, are all things. To him be the glory forever. Everything we do is to the glory of God. Then he goes in and says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy, that what we talked about back there in verse 36 in chapter 11 to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, to the 
Jewish people and the Gentile people, that would have seemed like a really strange thing. Because when you sacrifice something, especially in Judaism, what do you do with it? You burn it, you kill it. How do you have a living sacrifice? Of course, we believe Jesus is a living sacrifice. But also, your body is supposed to be a living sacrifice. You're supposed to give. Remember that? He talks about that gift later. You give that gift up as a sacrifice to God. You give your life, your behavior, what you do. You are a living sacrifice. You give things up. Because sacrifice means to give something up. And perhaps the last time I preached over this was during COVID. Um, we were outside. It was a beautiful day that day, if I remember right. And in that sermon, I talked about um, that if you did do something, even if you don't want to do it, but if you have the gift from God, the ability, even if you don't want to do it, if I have the gift of evangelism, but I don't want to do it today, but yet there's somebody there in front of me that needs to hear the word of God, am I doing my calling? Am I doing a sacrifice? Am I a living sacrifice? If I say, nope, not in the mood today. I don't want to do it. I don't particularly like that person. You need to do God's will. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Those are righteousness, holy and acceptable. That's something that is righteous, right with God. Unrighteousness would be unright with God, right? And so what is he talking about? The holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Thus do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Do not be conformed to this age. We're in the same age Paul was then, even though it's been better for 2,000 years. We're in the same church age. We're in that age between Jesus' ascension and his second coming. It's the same age. We're in that age. Do not be conformed to that age. And so what is Paul getting at? What is conforming to this world? He tells us that in chapter 1 in Romans. And you'll see that often in Paul's writings and a lot of the writings in the Bible. You'll have something, you'll, you'll have a, a short kind of staccato definition, or maybe sometimes a really brutal introduction to tell you what it is. And then he goes on and talks about it at length, maybe not quite so rough. And this is what happens in Romans. Chapter 1, verses 16 to 32. And I'm going to include 16 through 7, 16 and 17, not because they particularly pertain to what we're, we're talking about with this ungodliness and unrighteousness that we're supposed to avoid, that we're supposed to transform into something righteous, but rather just because it's such a beautiful affirmation of faith. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's a beautiful affirmation of faith. Verses 18 to 32 is God's wrath on unrighteousness. Those that conform to the world rather than transform the world, conform to God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in un up unrighteousness. That's the thing to remember, that, we, that we, we oftentimes in the world is pushing down the truth, telling you, as it says in Isaiah, how terrible it would be for people who call good things bad and bad things good, who think darkness is light and light is darkness, who think sour is sweet and sweet is sour. That's what the world does. That's Isaiah. Terry likes Isaiah. That's, those are Isaiah warning you about the time, this age that we're in, that Paul's talking about. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. They know what's right. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We know what's right. We've got the scripture to tell us. 
Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. They idol worship. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to disown their bodies among themselves, to exchange the truth of God for the lie, and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. They worship and serve themselves. The creature is us. It's the world. It's the worldliness in us. Are we serving the creature? Or are we serving God? Rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged natural use for what is against nature. And he's talking about sex there, folks. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Paul's pretty direct there. And there's a lot of times that those verses are excused away, but they can always skip over that verse burned in their lust for one another. I won't talk about that. And even as they did not like to retain, retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the, those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Those verses are very condemning to the church today, particularly the mainline Protestant movement. We're in deep trouble, folks, because we've approved, we, the church is approving of those who practice on many of the things that are listed there, not the least of which is worshiping and serving the creature. We worship and glorify that which is earthly rather than that which is holy. We're supposed to be worshiping God, not ourselves and not our activities. We're supposed to be God's hands and feet in this world. We're supposed to be creatures of mercy and grace and love and obedience. Now all of us fall short of the glory of God. Not a single one of us is perfect. We all sin. But what we should never do is try to twist the scripture to discard and to rationalize away our sins and somehow convert them into something that's holy and something that we adorn our churches and ourselves and our clergy rather than saying, forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned. So I don't know about you, when I read the scripture, I, get, I feel convicted a lot. And I've always said that if you're not paying attention, or if you're not being convicted when you read scripture, you're not really paying attention. The idea of scripture is not to give you a free pass and say everything you're doing is wonderful and great. It's to point out the things you need to do better, the things where you're falling short, the things you need to get right with God about. That's righteousness getting right with God. It's not about trying to find ways to, to convert what something says and explain it away in a cute fashion. And I know how that works. My mentor, Jesse, was really good at that. I loved him dearly. I pray for him. But Jesse was really good at explaining the way stuff he didn't like. And you got to be too careful that you don't get too clever by half 
as Paul talks about in here. Uh, professing to be wise, they became fools and they fell into unrighteousness rather than worship. We need to be careful about the world, folks. We are supposed to be transforming the world. That's what Scripture tells us. If we're doing what the world thinks is wonderful and great, are we transforming the world or are we conforming to the world? If we're conforming to this age, then you're not doing what Paul wrote. And we can argue about who wrote which books, but nobody argues that Paul didn't write Romans. And I've been in those discussions for many, many times, for many, many years, about which books are and aren't Paul's writings. But nobody argues that Paul didn't write Romans. And out of the gate in Romans, he tells you, first chapter, what we need to avoid and what we need to get right, and that we need to be right with God. Let's transform the world. But first, we need to be transformed ourselves. We need to read the scripture. We need to be honest with ourselves when we see that, that finger pointing at us. And we need to agree with those things and get right. Get right with God. Each and every one of us, myself included. Because again, we all fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus told the woman caught in adultery in John's Gospel how to deal with that sin that she had. She was caught in adultery. That was a sin. The men wanted to stone her. They brought her to him. And he gave her mercy. But don't forget the last sentence. And Jesus asked her, where have your accusers gone? There's no one here to condemn you. No one, sir, she said. And Jesus says, then, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Many verses say, go and sin no more. We're writing translations. Confess your sin to yourself. You don't need to confess your sin to me. We're not Catholic. You don't need to confess your sin to me or anyone else. Confess your sin to God. But do it today. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this day. Please forgive us when we fall short of what Paul writes to us. Forgive us when we try to explain away our sins and try to make little of them and like of them and ignore the consequences that are plainly written out in Scripture for us. Lord, forgive us this day. Let us be your hands and feet in this place. We pray this in your loving glory.